You guys, give it up. You've got a freedom fighter, Nathan Valentine. Give it up for him. So it's a great night in South Carolina. It's great to be with all of you. You know, I look out at this crowd, and it's so fun to think about what we all did together. When I became governor, we had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare, and South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. And we pulled together, and we rallied, and by the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes-Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies. They were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast. We got to work. We protected law enforcement by passing the first body camera bill in the country. We passed tort reform. We passed pension reform. But we acknowledged some truths. We said, if you have to show picture ID to buy suit if you have to show picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. We passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. Everything we did, we set the standard for the entire country to watch. And by the time I left, South Carolina was named the friendliest state in the country. We were named the most patriotic state in the country. And don't blame me for this one, but we were named the number two state in the country people were moving to. <laughs> and now I'm running for president, and it's been a year ago this week that I announced. And what a roller coaster it's been. We had 14 people in the race. We've defeated a dozen of those fellas. We just have one more fellow we got to catch up to. And you look at where we started. We had 2% in Iowa. We were able to get to 20% in Iowa, 1% away from second place. Then we went to New Hampshire. They said we were down 30 points in the polls, and we had 43% of the vote. And the night that we got 43%, Donald Trump had a temper tantrum on stage. He literally became unhinged and talked about revenge and my dress. <laughs> the next day he went and he said anybody that supports her is barred permanently from MAGA <laughs> now think about that for a second if you're running for president of the United States you want as many people coming to you not pushing people out of your club but we had a little fun with that, so we started selling t-shirts that said barred permanently. We sold over 20,000 t-shirts in doing that. <laughs> then the next day he went and he said that the RNC should name him the presumptive nominee. Well, we don't anoint kings in America. We have a democracy. And so he got pushed back and pulled back, and we said the people of South Carolina deserve the ability to vote. And so do all the rest of the states. That's right. And then he had a court case, and he lost another one. And he went and pitched a fit and talked about being a victim. Now, whether he was talking about revenge after New Hampshire or whether he was talking about being a victim after that court case, the problem I had with all of it was at no point did he ever talk about the American people. At no point did he talk about the fact that we're $34 trillion in debt. At no point did he talk about the fact that only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. At no point did he talk about an open border that's out of control. At no point did he talk about the lawlessness in our cities. And at no point did he talk about the wars around the world. He just talked about himself. And we can't continue to go in that direction. Then the campaign reports come out, and it shows that he spent $50 million of his campaign contributions on personal court cases. And now he's trying to take the RNC 
so that it can be the piggy bank for his legal fees. We've got to start focusing on what Americans need, not what Donald Trump needs. We are $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. Right now, for the first time, we're paying more in interest payments than we are a defense budget. You know who's noticing that? Russia, China, and Iran. And as much as I would love to tell you that Biden did that to us, I've always spoken to you in hard truths, and I'm going to do that with you today. Our Republicans did that to us, too. You go back and look at that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that they passed with no accountability. It expanded welfare to where we now have 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. That's a third of our country. And instead of Republicans trying to make it right, they doubled down and opened up pet projects and earmarks for the first time in 10 years, pushing through 7,000 of them last year. Instead, we've got to start focusing on what's really going to move our economy. And the way we do that is let's start by clawing back the $100 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are still out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, let's go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud. One out of every $7 was spent fraud. If 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? We'll stop the spending, we'll stop the borrowing, we'll eliminate their pet projects, and I'll veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. Then we'll take as many federal programs as we can and send them down to the state level. That will dramatically reduce the size of the federal government, but it will empower people on the ground. Think education, think health care, think welfare, think mental health. If we take those resources and put them down where people can customize them towards the state. And then we want to open up the middle class. We're watching the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So we want to make sure we cut taxes on the middle class and simplify the brackets. We want to eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country. And we want to make small business tax cuts permanent. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. We can't just say it. We've got to start acting like it. And speaking of acting like it, Congress has one job. One job, and that's to give us a budget on time. Do you know Congress has only given us a budget on time four times in 40 years? Four times in 40 years. You know what we're going to do about that? We're going to say, you don't give us a budget on time, you don't get paid, period. <laughs> Don't you think it's finally time we had term limits in Washington, D.C.? Don't you think we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75? Now, I'm not being disrespectful when I say that. We all know people who are over 75 that can run circles around us. And then we know Joe Biden. Congress has become the most privileged nursing home in the country. These are people making decisions on the future of our economy. These are people making decisions on our national security. It's nothing to play with. We need to know they're at the top of their game. That's why that matters. And then let's talk about what's happening at the board. I can't believe that the United States would allow this to happen. Eight and a half million illegal immigrants have come to that border. We've had more fentanyl cross the border last year that would kill every single American. Number one cause of death for adults 18 to 45, fentanyl. 
And don't think for a second China doesn't know what they're doing when they send it over. So we've got to start taking what we did in South Carolina and go national with it. We need to do a national e-verify program where our businesses have to prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. Let's defund sanctuary cities once and for all. No more safe havens in America. We'll put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We'll go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That's the way we'll deal with what happens on the border. Now, you look at the border bill that they had last week, and the issue with that is that border bill strengthened asylum laws. Now, three million illegal immigrants came in to America under President Trump because we didn't have strong enough asylum laws. But the weak part about the bill was it didn't have the Remain in Mexico policy, and it had a 5,000-person threshold. We can't wait for 5,000 people to cross to fix it. But this is where things went wrong. Two things happened. One, Congress needs to get in there and do their job. Pass a strong bill and don't leave D.C. until you get it done. What did they do? They're home for two weeks right now when they should be making sure that they pass a very strong border bill. Right. And then you've got President Trump, who told them not to pass anything until after the general election. Because once again, he made it about him. We can't afford to wait. America's acting like it's September 10th. We better remember what September 12th felt like. It only takes one to have a 9-11 moment. And then, growing up in rural South Carolina, my parents always taught me, you take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you for taking care of the, those who take care of us. Right now in America, over 35,000 veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. If a veteran needs a doctor's appointment, on average, it takes 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule. And the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. Now, I'm the proud wife of a combat veteran who served in Afghanistan. And when Michael came home to us, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. When we got home, life got hard. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone. And the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. We got to love them when they come back home, too. That's why we need to have telehealth so they can get the mental health care they need right when they need it. They should be able to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And I think the best way we go about dealing with VA health care. I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from the VA, and you watch how fast that gets there. It'll be the best health care you've ever seen, guaranteed. And then let's talk about national security. Right now, the world is on fire, literally. You've got a war in Europe, you've got a war in the Middle East, You've got North Korea testing intercontinental ballistic missiles. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that we left Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that said to our friends. More importantly, think about what that said to our enemies. Our goal should always be to prevent war, period. And national security and the safety of Americans matters. 
And last weekend, you had Donald Trump in Conway, South Carolina. And he said two things that should ring hollow, but should never, you should never forget what he said. First, he said that he would encourage Putin to invade any of our NATO allies that don't pull their weight. Now think about that. Trump is siding with a thug who kills his own political opponents. Trump is siding with a dictator who arrests American journalists and holds them hostage. Trump is siding with a madman who's made no bones about the fact that he wants to destroy America. And he took the side of Putin over our allies who stood with us after 9-11? When he did that, he put our allies in danger, he put our military men and women serving over there in danger, and he emboldened Putin. And right now we see Putin's now starting to put troops around the Baltic countries. And if he does that, and if that continues, he said, if he takes Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries that immediately puts America at war. This is about preventing war. And then Trump doubles down and mocks the military service of my husband. Now, Michael and I can handle that. When you're in politics, you're open to anything. But you mock one member of the military, you're mocking every member of the military. And the worst part is, in the beginning you could say, oh, this was a slip of the tongue. But this is a pattern. He said members of the military who lose their lives in combat are suckers and losers. He was at Arlington National Cemetery and said what was in it for them. He's never understood because he's never been around anybody in the military. We all know people in the military. We all know veterans. We all know those who sacrificed. We know people who've lost their lives. That's who we are in South Carolina. We're close to it. But he has never once understood what it means to sacrifice and be willing to shed blood for America. But our men and women in the military know freedom is not free. He's never been in the military. He's never gotten close to a military uniform. He's never had to lay on the ground. And the closest he's ever gotten to harm is getting hit by a golf ball on his golf course. <laughs> So we know what we need to do to, to protect Americans. We know what we need to do domestically and from a foreign policy standpoint. But now we have to figure out how to get there. And the only way we really save America is if we acknowledge the fact that we have to have a new generational leader. We can't keep going with the negativity and the baggage. of the future. And you look, listen to what the American people are telling everybody. 70% of Americans don't want to see Trump and Biden in a rematch. 59% of Americans have said that Trump's too old and Biden's too old. Both of those men put us trillions of dollars in debt that our kids are never going to forgive them for. Trump put us $8 trillion in debt in just four years. He claims it was COVID. That's not true. That was less than 25% of it. He grew government and he never cleaned it up. Now we're looking at the fact that we have too much. We can't have a country in disarray and a world on fire and rely on two men in their 80s to be our only hope. We can do better than that. a female president of the United States. But the hard truth is, 
it's either going to be me or Kamala Harris. All you have to do is look at the general election polls. In every one of the general election polls, Trump does not beat Biden. He's down by five. He's down by seven. On his best day, it's margin of error. He's even. In every one of those general election polls, I defeat Biden by up to 17 points. We do that. That's bigger than the presidency. That's House. That's Senate. That's governorships. But more than that, you win by double digits. You're going into D.C. with a mandate to stop the wasteful spending and get our economy back on track. A mandate to get our kids reading again and go back to the basics in education. A mandate to secure our border with no more excuses. A mandate to bring law and order back to our cities. And a mandate for a strong America that prevents wars that we can all be proud of. Don't you want that? <laughs> We can't continue to lose. Hard truth. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. But the reality is chaos follows him wherever he goes. He lost in 2018. He lost in 2020. He lost in 2022. But look at last week. He loses his case on immunity. He's now going to be tried as citizen Trump. Then the Republicans lose the, the vote on Mayorkas and the border. They lose the vote on Israel, and the RNC chair loses her job. And he had his fingerprints and all of that. Everything he touches, he loses. And that means we lose. So we've got a chance to make this right. And I have said the party that gets rid of their 80-year-old candidate is the party that wins. Yay! Biden will not be the nominee at the end of this. But we have to make sure that we do not have a President Kamala Harris. The other things that you need to know, I just saw that Trump put an ad on TV saying that I was for open borders. You know and we lived it. We passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. But if he's going to lie about me, I'm going to tell the truth about him. He proposed a 25 cent per gallon tax increase on all of us back in 2018 when he was president. He wants to increase taxes on every American family by putting tariffs on everything that comes into the country. So that means anything from baby strollers to appliances. It will cost every American family over $2,800 more a year. He's okay with cutting benefits to Social Security after 10 years. We can't keep living like this, but we don't have to. I look at all of these young people. Our goal should be to make them know what the American dream is. They should feel like they're not burdened by debt. They should feel like they can afford a home. They should feel like they're going to be able to get a job. They shouldn't have to worry about war. They should know that there's a country that has the brightest opportunities for them. But that means we've got to have someone who can serve eight years, disciplined, strong, and determined to give them a better life. Seven months ago, I dropped my husband, Michael, off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of lawn to go to a country they'd never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country 
country to save, but we have the opportunity to save her. And that means every one of you needs to go out and vote. You can early vote now, but you need to go take a yard sign. You need to go vote and take 10 people with you. You need to tell everybody you know that anybody can vote in this election as long as they didn't vote in the February 3rd Democrat primary. South Carolina, we know what it means to fight together, but we also know what it means to win together. When I announced, they asked me why I was running. And I said, you know, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that's strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for Michael and his military brothers and sisters. They need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married, and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. The average home buyer in America now is 49 years old. The American dream is leaving us. And I'm doing this for my son, who's a senior in college, and I am tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That's not us. That's not America. And for the first time, 81% of Americans don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save, but I will promise you this. You will join with us in this movement. You will join with us in this fight. I promise you, our best days are yet to come. Thank you very much. God bless.